Good morning and welcome everyone. Um, just waiting for the attendees to stabilize. Okay, great. We'll get started. Um, so good morning, everyone. Welcome to the webinar on the Transformative Climate Communities Program's Round 4 Draft Guidelines. We are excited to present the draft Round 4 Guidelines after two years. Uh, my name is Sophie Young. I'll be presenting alongside Transformative Climate Communities staff at the Department of Conservation, including Brian newman Lindsay, Brendan Pipkin, and Jacob Byrne. And we also have other TCC staff on the line to answer questions during the Q&A session. And Sarah Newsham is the host and also the um, tech support. So if you have any issues, you can send her any questions. So here's the agenda for today. So the TCC program was created through legislation to fund community-led climate resilient development and infrastructure plans that provide multiple community benefits. And the program vision for transformation is centered on a place-based approach with a focus on funding neighborhood plans in the most disadvantaged communities in the state. And we wanted to note something about this term disadvantaged communities. SGC recognizes the term disadvantaged overlooks many of the assets and existing efforts in communities. And we use this term in line with the California Environmental Protection Agency's Environmental Justice Screening Tool that defines disadvantaged communities as census tracts with high pollution and socioeconomic burdens. So as mentioned, TCC funds community-driven proposals and is structured to provide residents and stakeholders with the tools and resources to drive change in their communities. We make significant investments to support the deployment of multiple integrated climate strategies and projects carried out through strong partnerships at the local level and with the state. So to date, um, to date, the program has invested over $230 million in 26 communities, and we administer this program in partnership with the Department of Conservation. The program's first three rounds were funded under the California Climate Investments, administered by the California Air Resources Board, and the next few years of funding will come from the General Fund's climate budget, but the program will continue to partner with the California Air Resources Board in order to keep core elements of the climate investment framework consistent with years past. So here's an image of what a, an awarded project looks like on the ground. This is from our round one grantee Ontario, and it includes a zero net energy affordable housing development with various clean transit connectivity projects across the city, including connectivity to a new job center downtown and also a new carbon farm that will distribute soil to community farms and residents in the neighborhood. So applicants select projects that build resilience and improve livelihoods and access to key destinations and must show how they're integrated within a neighborhood. In addition, the uh, unique from other programs, TCC also funds projects that we call transformative plans to ensure that physical infrastructure investments also provide direct and meaningful benefits to residents and stakeholders. So the program has six transformative elements um, that must be included in each proposal. And these are intended to further the transformative potential of the investment and ensure direct and meaningful benefits to existing residents and stakeholders by ensuring community decision-making through implementation, economic benefits to residents, avoided harm and displacement uh, while building resilience to future climate impacts. In addition, there's a leverage requirement that boosts the catalytical, the catalytic potential of the investment to sustain community revitalization and development beyond the grant term. Past grantees have been able to amplify their TCC investment with other projects during the grant and beyond by attracting additional leverage to their neighborhoods. And finally, long-term tracking allows us to assess the outcomes and apply the lessons learned. So TCC has two types of grants, implementation and planning. And we've awarded eight implementation grants across the state since 2018, with grants ranging between 10 and $66.5 million. Each project has a range of 10 to 20 different projects. And on the right are some images of the work that has been done to date. 
And just wanted to note that three of our um, round three implementation grantees are all previous planning grantees, City of Oakland, Stockton, and Riverside. And here's a map of the um, TCC's awarded planning grants across the state, which are 18 grants across the state in rural and urban areas. And these historically have been between 100 and $200,000 in order to support community visioning and project development. And on the right is an image from a historic participatory budgeting process in Fresno, which is a round one uh, implementation grantee, but is an image I think that represents the planning process um, that we are trying to support through our planning grants. And if you would like additional information, the TCC website has full summaries of all of our previous implementation and planning grantees with links to their project websites. And so now we'll get into the funding available for round four. This year, the budget allocated 420 million to TCC over the next three years, 115 for this year. And we're excited to be able to restore our original goal to make $35 million implementation grants. And we are also increasing our planning grants to 300,000 dollars each to provide additional resources. And here's a draft timeline for round four. So after public comment ends on December 15, we hope to adopt the final guidelines in January and put out the application soon after with a four month application time period. And before I turn it over to my colleague, um, just wanted to note that throughout this presentation, we have noted where our draft changes for round four in these yellow boxes on each slide. And now uh, my colleague Brian will go over the uh, implementation grants program. Hopefully this works. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us today. Um, we're really excited to be here to share the program um, and to hear the feedback you guys have. I can't see how many participants we have, but I saw it was at least 50. Um, so I'm looking forward to hearing from you and maybe we will get to work with you in the future. Um, Sophie explained at the start of this that the, the core of the TCC program is place-based is based on community-led visions, integrates multiple projects together within that place, and conducts the work through the, our transformative planning process. So as we talk about the implementation grants, I'm going to talk about the first three things there, um, applica applicants and eligibility, the planning area, and what projects look like before Brendan takes over to talk about transformative plans and some of the additional details of the projects of the program. So to start, like the TCC program is really based on the community and based on the coalition you develop to implement the work that's relevant to your neighborhood and your region. So for every TCC project, there needs to be a collaborative stakeholder structure that's established with one lead applicant who will work with SGC and DOC to implement the grant partnered with the co-applicants who are implementing projects or performing other key functions in that group. There's a lot of different means you can use to qualify for eligibility um, in, your, in your region. Community-based organizations are eligible, governmental organizations, California Native American tribes, nonprofits. It's really more about what your specialty is and what your community needs. There are a few additional Stricter, stricter requirements. Um, so one important one is that a lead or co-applicant needs to be a public agency and needs to provide support for the project. And then every lead entity needs to have the capacity to implement the work that's scheduled to them. So the, the lead applicant needs to have management ability and financial capacity to manage the entire project. And a co-applicant who's a lead on a specific project needs to have the expertise and the capacity to ensure that that project's carried forward. Um, our grantees have taken different approaches to this depending on the partners they had and the needs that they um, 
we're trying to fill. So there's different ways to accomplish this, but we need to make sure that every coalition has the tools at their disposal to accomplish the work in their community. So that's applicants. And then for the place, there are specific project area requirements um, to ensure that all the work is integrated into one neighborhood where the projects can relate to each other and help build change in that neighborhood. The project area for TCC um, hasn't changed. So it needs to be a continuous area, contiguous area, um, approximately five square miles and can't cross jurisdictional boundaries. Um, within that, there's a fair amount of flexibility for you to define what your project should look like. Then secondarily, we also target priority populations to make sure that the investments are reaching needed communities. Um, we've expanded the eligibility for priority populations that are considered quote unquote disadvantaged um, from 10%, which was the case in, our, in, the, in round one, up to 25% in the new, new version of the Calum virus screen tool. And we've also added fairly recognized tribal boundaries. So that's um, reservations, rancheras, fee lands, et cetera. Um, the remaining portion of the project needs to meet different criteria. And then finally for project area, we've expanded access to disadvantaged unincorporated communities. Um, we really wanna make sure that we're, we're trying to create access to the program for a wide range of communities with different needs. Um, this was a little bit of a challenge. And so the solution to it is a little bit complicated. There's four different methods to determine eligibility as a quote unquote duck. Um, and you just need to meet one of them. I'm not gonna go over each of these specifics here, but I just wanna note that there's people who can help you navigate this. And because project area eligibility can be pretty complicated, whether or not you're a disadvantaged unincorporated community or your community may cross different census tracts. We've created a TCC mapping tool, which will be linked in the comments in the chat um, so that you can go take a look at it. And we have a tutorial as well on how to use that tool to sort of look at your area and see how it may work and whether your community may fit into uh, the program. So that's applicants and area. When you have those two things, you have your coalition, you have your area. The next thing is to develop your projects that you want to implement. Um, this needs to come through the vision process. So we ask every coalition, every collaborative stakeholder group to work with their community and work in their community to define those community needs. We want to hear what you think your community needs for greenhouse gas reduction, public health, environmental benefits, economic prosperity, right? When you do that, collect your vision statement, and then you will build out your proposal across multiple different strategies. And those strategies can contain multiple projects to accomplish them. And then throughout that, we'll have our transformative elements and you'll engage in the planning process, community engagement that Sophie talked about before. There's 12 different strategies expanded from the original nine that we've been working with, um, crossing a variety of sectors. Um, and you can mix and match these. We require our applicants to have at least three strategies to ensure that there's kind of a, a broad range of work that's being done. But within that, it's up to you to figure out what your community needs and how you wanna approach it. So for each strategy, when you go into the guidelines, the Appendix B breaks down the requirements and options for each strategy. So you'll see that there'll be a table or a section um, that lays out what the specific strategy is. Here it's active transportation. It'll list the categories of projects that we can, that we can approve. Um, or have already identified within the within that strategy, and then list the fundable elements for what what we know that the work contains that we can um, pay for and approve. It's not necessarily exclusive, um, but generally this is this is what the work is. And you'll notice that in that first list, there's an asterisk on um, one of the elements. It's called a quantifiable element. Conversely, down here, you see publicly accessible bicycle parking is non-quantifiable. This relates back to the greenhouse gas reduction requirement. So coming from CARB, we need to ensure that the projects we develop are having an impact 
on overall climate change and reducing the greenhouse gas emissions in your region, in your neighborhood. So quantifiable refers specifically to a quantifiable established method or a project with a quantifiable established methodology for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. They can have other quantities, but that's not what this means. So because this has quantifiable elements, this is considered a quantifiable project. In order for your TCC project as a whole to be eligible, you need to have at least three projects that are quantifiable. Those three projects also need to be ready, which means that at the start of your grant, they're ready to go, right? Those projects must account for 50% of the overall grant funds, and then the rest of it is a lot more flexible about how you want to approach the work. But all projects have to be ready within one year. So what is readiness? You might be able to imagine, right? Uh, ready means that the project is ready to begin construction or begin implementation. There's specific readiness requirements we have, which are laid out in the guidelines, and we can go into additional detail if needed. Three big ones are uh, that the SQL process has been either begun um, or completed, that you have control of the site that you're proposing to work on, that you have the necessary permits you need, um, or that you know you can obtain them by the time that the work needs to be accomplished. Additional readiness requirements for all projects are designs, maps, operation, maintenance plans, and project schedules. Um, schedules are new as an explicit readiness requirement. And so we're happy to work with anybody who needs clarification on what that's going to look like through the TA process. Whew. Um, there's one other thing I wanted to say, but I apologize. I've lost the thread there. So I'm gonna move on um, and pass things over to Brendan to take it from here. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. So Sophie mentioned earlier, uh, the transformative elements are meant to work together to uh, further the program objectives and ensure that the proposed strategies and projects result in various co-benefits, co excuse me, for the residents of the project area. Um, applicants are required to address all six of these transformative elements in their application. Um, and we'll explain each of these uh, in a little bit more detail in the upcoming slides. Um, there we go. Um, so applicants must develop back. Applicants must develop a community engagement plan with two main sections. Um, the first being a description of the community engagement that was used during the proposal development to uh, identify, prioritize, and select the proposed projects, as well as a description of future community engagement uh, that will happen throughout the grant, uh, including things like education, outreach, and engagement, and soliciting feedback to inform the project implementation. The major changes we wanted to highlight for round four, and that we're fairly excited to, uh, to be able to propose, are expanded eligible costs that include uh, food, childcare, transportation uh, and compensation to, to expand access uh, to these types of community engagement meetings for, um, for residents who have formerly not been able to be quite as involved. The workforce development program looks through. Workforce development uh, and economic opportunities plan will also include two major components. Uh, the first being a proposed workforce development and education training programs that provides training uh, and job placement services to residents of the project area, as well as some local partnership development, um, as well as an explanation of how the TCC investment through the proposed strategies and projects will create high quality jobs in the project area. The major changes you'll see in the guidelines for round four are that we clarified the eligible activities uh, to further support what are called high road workforce practices, things like planning and partnerships to ensure that uh, the um, workforce programs will prepare residents for a carbon constrained economy um, and work with local industry to ensure that uh, the local needs are met. Um, the third transformative element is the displacement avoidance plan to ensure that TCC investments uh, don't result in, in displacement of the project area residents. Uh, so for this plan, applicants will describe the current displacement vulnerabilities for both residents and small businesses, as well as the current displacement avoidance policies or programs that may be uh, in place in the project area at the city level or uh, services that may be being offered by nonprofits. Uh, and then for this plan, applicants will propose new policies and programs specifically to be developed through the TCC grant 
And the change we want to highlight for round four is requesting that applicants map out the policies as short-term versus long-term strategies so that the plan addresses immediate uh, displacement vulnerabilities as well as long-term planning resilience. Uh, the fourth plan is the Climate Adaptation and Resiliency Plan. The applicants for this will identify climate change risks in the project area, as such as extreme heat or wildfire or sea level rise. We'll discuss the anticipated impacts of these potential uh, uh, changes, and then describe how the proposed projects uh, will reduce the ri risk for the project area and promote resiliency. Uh, and we wanna note that this is not a funded transformative element, uh, but is required to ensure that the entire project proposal as developed is supporting key climate adaptation and key resiliency goals in the project area. Fifth uh, transformative element is leverage funding. As Sophie mentioned earlier, uh, this element is meant to catalyze and enhance additional investments in the project area. Uh, and to meet this, this requirement, applicants must leverage uh, additional funding equal to at least 50% of the requested grant funds. A couple of uh, key points there, those funds must be committed uh, and verifiable at the time of application. Those funds must be spent in the TCC project area between the, the award date and the end of the project period. Uh, and just a note that for standalone leverage projects, uh, applicants must demonstrate that the investment was initiated uh, in, in anticipation of applying for the TCC program uh, or that that investment is contingent upon a TCC award. Um, and more information can be uh, found on that in the guidelines themselves. And the last transformative element we wanna highlight is the data collection and indicator tracking element. Um, throughout the grant, uh, grantees will uh, track two main categories of indicators. The first one being greenhouse gas emissions reductions and co-benefit indicators for the California Air Resources Board. Um, and, and as was mentioned earlier, there will be technical assistance to, to provide this uh, ad application um, and throughout the grants through, through an evaluation provider. And then we'll also ask uh, pro, uh, awardees to collect program specific indicators for TCC based on the specific projects uh, and strategies that have been chosen. Uh, grantees and partners are also participating in qualitative evaluations during the grants. Um, so we encourage lead and co-applicants to really ensure that adequate budget is allocated uh, for their partners to participate in data collection and reporting throughout the grants. Um, ideally, about 2% of the total TCC award should be uh, allocated to this, um, this uh, evaluation plan. Um, within these transformative elements, there are a number of cost caps uh, and requirements. Uh, that we want to um, highlight here, but that have more detail in the guidelines. 3% uh, of the total requested funds are required to be allocated to data collection and, 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 sorry, and indicator tracking, and that will be allocated to a pre-qualified uh, evaluation provider uh, through SGC. Um, the community engagement plan can take up to 8% of the requested funds. Uh, of that 8%, up to 3% of the total funds can be for displacement avoidance. Um, and then up to 5% of the requested funds can be used for the workforce development and economic opportunities plan. As mentioned, there's no funding available for the climate adaptation and resiliency plan, uh, but this should be developed to, to ensure that the rest of the funded projects meet the climate adaptation and resiliency goals. Um, and leverage funding are additional funds brought into the project area uh, as a part of the application process. The next section that we wanna talk about in the guidelines are the policy priorities that you'll see mentioned, uh, and that can be highlighted through the, the application process. The first policy priority that we try to highlight in the SGC process is, uh, or sorry, in the TCC process is connectivity to the high-speed rail project. Uh, this is only applicable to applicants with planned high-speed rail stations along the uh, initially planned Silicon Valley to Central Valley line. Um, so, for example, we'll note that the round one Fresno project that was mentioned earlier is a good example of this, where they have a high speed rail project going downtown and um, the projects proposed provide connectivity uh, and active transportation to that center. Uh, the next policy priority we want to highlight is access to basic infrastructure, uh, regional services and job centers. This is an important element to ensure TCC investment will provide long term community benefits. Um, and we do recognize that this can be challenging for some communities. So a change for round four is that there is now a 10% allowance for water and wastewater infrastructure connection uh, to support that access to basic infrastructure where it is needed, um, again, to make sure that the investment is, is long-term and sustainable. 
Um, another policy priority is the pro-housing policy. Uh, this incentive uh, provides incentive for jurisdictions that are facilitating sustainable housing production. The change for round four in this guidelines is that this year, applicants will receive full incentive points for jurisdictions that are designated as pro-housing uh, jurisdictions under the Department of Housing and Community Development's pro-housing designation program, which was established in July, 2021. And the last policy priority we wanna highlight is the pollution prevention and mitigation policy priority, which adds incentives for applicants to reduce and mitigate pollution sources in the project area over time. Again, in support of the public health and greenhouse gas reduction benefits of this program. Uh, so the more you can link uh, to these policy priorities throughout your application and proposed projects, the more it shows just sort of the, the comprehensive and, and strategic regional planning uh, that this can support in, in support of other uh, proposed projects and goals as well. Um, so that, that covers a little bit about strategies and, and transformative plans that are available. So now we want to speak to the application components that you'll see uh, written in the guidelines and when the application materials are released. The application will be entire, entirely online this year uh, and it will include documentation uh, that will uh, establish the grantee's threshold eligibility. So we'll require a set of documentation, including project maps, leverage funding commitment letters, uh, documents that show financial and management capacity uh, and more. Um, for each specific project and plan, we'll also have a set of narrative questions that describe what the proposals will be, as well as for the grant as a whole, and then detailed budgets and work plans for all projects and plans. So there will be specific budgets and work plans that will uh, clarify how they propose to meet the, uh, the proposed projects um, and the final deliverables. Uh, Brian talked a little bit about the readiness requirements. So we will also require readiness documentation for all quantifiable projects. You'll see that for some projects, um, it will be okay for them to be able to just demonstrate that they meet readiness within the first year. So don't necessarily have to be entirely shovel ready at uh, application, but there is a requirement for at least 50% uh, of the funds in those projects to be from uh, ready projects. Um, and then quantification documentation and greenhouse gas emissions reductions uh, documentation it will also be supported through technical assistance uh, in the application. Uh, to briefly touch on the scoring criteria, the vision for transformation will be worth 40 points. The capacity of the partners to implement the grant will be worth 30 points. The transformative elements are worth 75 points. Um, Again, this is a really important element of the program. There are a number of infrastructure programs out there, but these transformative elements are, are really key to, uh, again, ensure that those investments are long-term, sustainable, and really uh, provide co-benefits to the residents of the proposed project area. The projects themselves are worth 50 points in there, and then the pro-housing incentives are worth five points for a total of 200. And so there's more detail, again, on this in the guidelines. Um, there's also technical assistance provided throughout um, the application and uh, implementation phase. Uh, at application, technical assistance will be provided uh, to, to help partners understand the threshold eligibility requirements for the program. Um, the application assistance will also include uh, some of those things that Brian mentioned are, are um, required for communities to develop their proposals. So working on, on community project visions that will inform the, how the strategies are selected, how the projects are prioritized, et cetera. Capacity building can include uh, working with local partners to develop uh, stronger partnerships, uh, engaging, engaging new partners, uh, providing skills building templates or, or capacity building templates to, to support partnerships, and then assistance with uh, greenhouse gas calculations as well. Through a little too fast here. Um, so I just wanted to give an example of what one of these uh, full project visions and sets of strategies and plans looks like. From the round one grant here, we have the city of Fresno's Transform Fresno grant. Uh, and their vision was uh, to really uh, focus on the uh, southwest part of Fresno that has historically been disinvested in, uh, the downtown to Chinatown sections of this. Um, and as we mentioned, there is a high-speed rail station going into downtown. The project really focused on providing affordable housing in the southwest of Fresno with connectivity to the high-speed rail station. A heavy focus on urban greening, as you can see here in the left strategy with six projects in urban greening uh, to, to uh, plant trees and urban greening elements in the project area and provide shading. 
Uh, there's also solar and energy efficiency projects, active transportation projects to increase that connectivity between key community sites, as well as a low carbon transportation network. We also have a number of standalone leverage projects that also support the TCC um, investments and intent, such as local connector buses um, and improvement districts. Um, and then we wanted to highlight the transformative plans that are a part of all uh, proposals, which include the community engagement, workforce development, displacement avoidance and indicator tracking here. Um, so again, just to call out that this shows the types of uh, varieties and ranges of strategies that can be selected, um, as well as the number of projects within those strategies. Um, and so just to show a few more examples briefly, um, here is the another round one site, the Housing Authority of the City of Los Angeles, or what the Watts Rising Project, as a different set of strategies and, and projects. Um, as well as the city of Ontario. You can see here there's less of the urban greening, more of a focus on the affordable housing and sustainable communities. So as Brian said, this is really intended to meet the needs of the community um, and, and how they identify that. Uh, but with that, I'll go ahead and pass it off to my colleague, Jacob Byrne, to uh, speak about the planning grants element. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for attending today. So I'll give you a brief overview of uh, the planning grant portion of the TCC program. So planning grants are much smaller than implementation grants, both in the size of the grants being awarded, as well as the, term, the length of the term. And these planning grants are intended to allow uh, organizations to um, complete standalone planning activities while also building capacity to allow them to pursue further grant funding for the state. So in a lot of cases, particularly round three, that ended up being uh, the planning grantees pursuing TCC implementation grants, but it can also be other state programs as well. Sorry. Uh, so let's talk about some examples of past uh, planning grants and what you might be able to do with a planning grant uh, in round four. Um, so again, they're really focused on building capacity among the staff of uh, community-based organizations or local planning jurisdictions, um, as well as engaging a, uh, external stakeholders and community members in the planning process. Um, you might do that through pre preparation of a climate action plan or an adaptation plan, uh, or perhaps a uh, feasibility study for community land trust as well. Now, if, uh, for el applicant eligibility, this list is actually exactly the same as the implementation grant. So I don't think we need to bear uh, to spend too much time on it, but it is uh, included in the uh, TCC guidelines as well for your review. Uh, some key differences, though, with regard to applicant eligibility are the number of applicants required for inclusion in a planning grant. Um, so you must uh, have a minimum of two applicants. That's one lead applicant and one co-applicant. However, during the uh, application scoring process, we will give um, further credit to those applicants that are showing strong and diverse partnerships. So often multiple partners can help the overall uh, success of these planning grants. Um, and one key requirement similar to implementation grants is that either the lead applicant or the co-applicant must be a public agency. These planning grants also have uh, area requirements. Um, again, this is included in the guidelines um, and it hasn't actually, it hasn't changed at all since round three. So I'm not gonna spend too much time on it except to emphasize again that the uh, SGC's website does have a mapping tool that will make this process a lot easier for you all. I encourage you to use that to determine if your uh, jurisdiction is eligible for planning grants. Um, again, because planning grants are much smaller, the application requirements are much less. Um, basically, we're gonna ask you to, to demonstrate that you're eligible. We're gonna ask you what your project, what you wanna do with the planning grant, and then ask some details about the budget and the work plans as well. Uh, scoring criteria, uh, just out of 100 points rather than the 200 for the implementation grant. Again, this is presented in the guidelines, so I won't go too far into it here, um, but please do take some time to review to, so uh, you can uh, adjust your application accordingly. And then once you've submitted your uh, application for either an implementation grant or a planning grant, um, and hopefully you'll get the award, uh, we'll move into the grant administration phase. And so I'm going to talk about administration for implementation grants first, and then we'll circle back and discuss um, some details for planning grants. 
Um, so I think you've seen this slide before, uh, it, uh, but I, it bears repeating here um, because this is really how the TCC um, program is going to be governed. So the key link here is between the Strategic Growth Council and the grantee, the lead applicant. There's going to be a grant agreement between those two organizations, and the Strategic Growth Council will have uh, direct contact with the grantee. Now below the grantee, there's going to be those co-applicants, the partners, and they're going to be connected through a partnership agreement. That partnership agreement will be included in the grant agreement, um, and it will uh, kind of affect all aspects of uh, the administration of this grant, including um, the disbursement of funds and the reimbursement for grant work. So during an implementation grant, uh, grantees will be reimbursed every two months or on a bi-monthly basis. The way that will occur is that a grantee will request reimbursement from the SGC. The SGC will pay the grantee directly, and then the grantee will disperse those payments out to their partners. So following that uh, structure that we were just seeing on the last slide. Um, so with regard to reimbursement, there are certain eligible costs and ineligible costs or costs that cannot be uh, reimbursed through the program. Um, these costs are broken down in great detail in the guidelines, specifically in the appendices, um, but I will just touch on a few here. So we've got the eligible costs. These are the costs that will be reimbursed as part of the uh, TCC implementation grants. The largest portion of the total grant award is going to go to direct implementation costs. And what we mean by direct implementation costs are things like equipment, uh, travel expenses, staff time, labor, and so forth. And that staff time does include time spent uh, on grant administration specifically. Um, so we do try to support that uh, through direct implementation costs. We also try to support your organizations through indirect costs as well. So you can think of those as overall uh, overhead costs, just general costs of doing business. And we're happy to have expanded the, that indirect cost support from previous rounds. Previously, it was capped at 10%. We're now raising that to 12% to make sure that we can really support um, your organizations as you implement these uh, large grants. Along with the invoicing requirements that will occur on a bi-monthly basis, we also have various types of reporting that we'll require. So you'll have to update us on the progress of the uh, different projects and strategies. Um, we'll ask for some budget updates. You'll be constantly doing data collection, indicator tracking, and then at the end of the grant term, you'll also have a closeout report that you provide to us with some feedback and how we can improve the program. Now, in addition to those uh, details regarding the uh, costs in the uh, appendices of the grant guidelines, there's also a sample grant agreement in Appendix H of the grant guidelines. So this is going to be included in the eventual grant agreement for our awardees. So I encourage you to take a look at these standard terms to, to kind of figure out what we're going to be requiring of our grantees. And I'll also uh, encourage you all to take a look at Appendix F. Appendix F deals with the post-award consultation process. So that's the process of once we've given, once we've uh, let you know that you have been awarded the grant, we work through this post-award consultation process to really hammer out the details of your project and the grant agreement as well. So I really want grantees um, and applicants to understand the time that it takes to work through that process and how much work it is to get through it and the timeline where, uh, before which you'll be able to implement your programs. Now, uh, planning grants also have a similar structure for grant administration, um, and we can see that on this slide here. So a uh, similar kind of structure, overall structure, but there are a couple key differences here. Um, so while the Strategic Growth Council and the grantee will have a, a similar type of grant agreement st uh, structuring their, uh, their um, relationship, the relationship between the grantee, the lead applicant, and the co-applicants is slightly different for planning grants. The co-applicants will actually be subcontractors, so there won't be a partnership agreement here, but the overall structure is, is pretty much the same except for that nuance. Uh, because that structure is set up the same, the payments are also going to be the same for planning grantees, where SGC will pay the lead grantee, and then the grantee will then pay their partners, their subcontractors. A key difference here, though, is the timing. So whereas implementation grants are paid bi-monthly, planning grants will be paid quarterly or on a three-month basis. Um, again, planning grants are required to do some reporting, but as you can see, it's, it's uh, much reduced as compared to the implementation grants. So we're only going to require progress reports with those quarterly payments and then a final progress report as well, summarizing your work. Now, finally, uh, the um, planning grants do have a split between eligible and ineligible costs. Again, these are detailed in the grant um, guidelines, um, but I'll just note here again, 
So we will support indirect costs um, expanded for planning grants as well from 10% in round three to 12% in round four. Um, direct, direct costs will be some supported and we're really excited to expand that community, those community engagement costs as well. We think this is a great opportunity to uh, allow our planning grantees to uh, reach out to their community and really reach those members of the community that can be difficult to reach without some of these incentives. Um, so we're really, really excited for that change. Um, and with that, I'll turn it back over to my colleague, Sophie. Uh, thank you very much. Great, so that concludes our presentation. And we just wanted to point out some key points of feedback that we would like from you all. Um, so as a reminder, we are accepting public comments through December 15th, and those can be sent to our email box right here. And so here are some of the more substantial changes to the round four draft guidelines um, for your consideration. Oops. Um, so now we'll move into questions and answers. Uh, first, I will answer some of these written questions. And then um, us and the team will answer these written questions. And then please do raise your hand if you'd like to answer, ask a question verbally. So there was one question that was asked earlier, will these slides be available after the presentation? Yes, we will post them to the website um, probably in the following week or two. The next question is, uh, will scores be weighted to favor first time TCC recipients? Are past recipients eligible? And the answer is yes. Um, sorry, the answer is yes, that past recipients are eligible, but we will not necessarily be weighting the scores to favor first time TCC recipients. The guidelines outline that uh, past um, recipients are eligible, but what's not eligible are overlapping project areas. And will the attendee list be made available? And the answer is yes, unless um, if you all are not comfortable with your information being shared, please do send us a note after this webinar and we will not share your information. A next question from Kayla, are there significant changes to requirements around the strategy one equitable housing and neighborhood development? strategy project type between the last and current cycles for implementation grants? And the answer is no, we still uh, incorporate the affordable housing and sustainable communities guidelines. So if there are changes to those guidelines, then we will have those incorporated into ours. And the next question from Anna, is there room to qualitatively demonstrate that communities within census tracts not identified as disadvantaged by EnviroScreen are in fact disadvantaged? I think there's ongoing concern that aggregated data at the census tract level might erase at-risk communities at the micro neighborhood scale. And the answer is um, yes, in particular for the um, unincorporated areas, we've outlined how unincorporated communities can determine their eligibility by submitting localized data. Um, so if you have additional follow-up questions, please do let us know. Okay, and then another question, can an agency submit a planning grant and an implementation grant for different projects? The answer is, Yes, there's no cap on that. Um, so. The next question is, can you clarify further what needs to be in place in order to apply for a planning grant? Seems like the process would be used to figure out the specific implementation plans. And I would like to ask either Jacob or Brendan um, to, answer this question. Sure. Thanks, Sophie. Um, for a planning grant, uh, there are still eligibility requirements. Um, Jacob actually spoke to this a little bit in that uh, second part of the presentation. 
I'd highlight the uh, part of the guidelines that speak specifically to the eligibility requirements for lead uh, applicants. Uh, but there needs to be a proposal in place for a set of uh, community engagement plans uh, with, with a final deliverable. So for example, past applicants have been able to use planning grants uh, to identify uh, or to, to lead community engagement, identify the types of projects folks in the community would need. Um, but they proposed uh, a specific set of um, already pre-identified sort of topics to, to strategize that community engagement result, for example, around uh, affordable housing or around uh, workforce uh, development or uh, active transportation. So generally that, that guides the planning processes and then the planning uh, deliverable will be a, a plan based off of that. Um, and uh, I'll ask uh, Sophie or Jacob uh, if you wanna add any more to that answer of what's required. Uh, thank you, Brendan. No, I think that covers it. Yeah, planning grants are really meant to scaffold um, the the further um, or future application to implementation grants. So the readiness requirements are, are pretty low, um, but yeah, I think you covered them pretty well. Thank you. Okay, and then we have another question here. Um, do you have an estimate on the timeline of the overall application process? And that process is four months. So I see in the chat, um, Sharon, you asked a question, can applicants request less than 35 million? Is, T, is technical assistance available now? And how do you expect community engagement with COVID? Um, I'm gonna start answering those and then I hope some of my colleagues will jump in because they've been more in the weeds on community engagement in particular. But for this round, um, we tried to target 35 million uh, specifically to see, to, to get a suite of projects that we think can affect sort of that transformative change in these communities. Um, so the main, so I think the expectation is that applications will be limited to 35 million. Um, Sophie, I don't think technical assistance for this round is set up yet, and that that will exist once we actually submit, um, put out the NOFA. Um, and then some of our existing grantees have had really innovative and interesting community engage engagement uh, activities with COVID. The situation is obviously changing a lot. Um, so I don't know if, uh, one of my colleagues who've been working with that I want to share some of what uh, our colleagues have, what our partners have done. Um, there was also a report out on community engagement that we can share. Uh, just to the first point about technical assistance, um, it's not available now. We're in the process of an RFP for a provider, and that will be available once the application period starts ne early next year. And it looks like Brendan would be able to speak to the um, community engagement during COVID. Sure, thank you. Um, yeah, this has been obviously a challenge for a number of the grantees we've worked with, but they've, they've been able to um, really come up with some innovative uh, uh, ways to, to address this. Um, and, and some less innovative, but more um, uh, just sort of on the ground, uh, um, sort of working the streets methods for this. So um, I'd say when COVID came that uh, some of our community engagement partners were able to shift um, uh, somewhat virtually, um, but somewhat just uh, in, their, in their physical presence. Um, Many of them were able to, to have a presence at local community sites where services were being offered through COVID. Um, so for example, some community engagement partners were able to go to um, uh, school sites uh, where that became sort of food service centers uh, and things like that. So some uh, of the community engagement was able to shift to directly just meet folks with where they were at. But a lot of the community engagement uh, was finding ways to uh, move on online, move virtual. And, and the challenge there was ensuring that folks um, who may not have the technological capacity were then still able to be engaged and, and um, involved in those processes. So that actually took a lot of um, sort of community capital uh, to reach those folks that um, they think may have dropped off. So 
a lot of the uh, local community engagement lead organizations would do phone banking, knocking on doors um, in, a, in a COVID safe way to really ensure that they provide then uh, resources and training um, on how to engage in virtual meetings. So some of those were just uh, walking folks through uh, how to use Zoom. Um, some of that was, was providing, uh, making sure to provide call-in numbers so folks who aren't able to use this were able to, to call in by you know, an old fashioned phone uh, service. Um, but it did actually take then a, a much more sort of just targeted uh, and um, focused approach to, to ensure that folks uh, were being reached despite COVID. Um, now that that's, uh, now that things have shifted a little bit so that some are in person and some are virtual, uh, we've had we've had grantees start to have both in-person and virtual uh, meetings for public meetings so that those who are comfortable going in person where where it's appropriate and, and fits local mandates or, or local uh, uh, health policies uh, are able to attend in person but then there are still virtual options for uh, folks to provide um, feedback uh, if they prefer that way so there are a number of ways people have been able to pivot um, the hybrid model for, for community engagement is still being worked out, but a lot of folks are doing uh, both the online and virtual. Um, and then again, just doing that expanded outreach to make sure that folks, um, particularly uh, elderly residents, can still uh, engage as needed. Um, so I hope that gives a, a little bit of the ideas of the types of pivots that um, our community engagement partners have done with COVID. I'd also like to mention that our transformative plans appendices have additional resources. Um, including for designing community engagement during COVID-19. So hopefully that can also be a helpful resource for you all. And then I'll um, pop over to the Q&A. There are a couple questions in here and then we'll go back to the chat questions. Um, a question from Stella, has SGC documented roadblocks and lessons learned from past projects so that future groups can learn from these efforts? As well, what has SGC done to address and overcome these roadblocks? And this is a great question because we have been working on this with every single funding round. Um, we do document all those internally and we reflect them in all of our, in the guidelines. As, you, as you've seen, we try to be responsive to some of those. Um, and then also to some of our internal processes around um, the application, streamlining of the application or the post-award consultation process or even um, grant administration. So um, that's one way that we've been doing that on kind of an ongoing adaptive uh, basis. And um, one thing that we have a goal for is to also put out more case studies uh, on lessons learned. So um, that uh, look out for that in the next year. And then in addition, we, as part of the uh, program evaluation, uh, the program evaluation technical assistance providers do provide a process evaluation memo on an annual basis, assessing what are some of the barriers uh, in the program so that we can address those on an ongoing basis. And then a second question from Kyle, um, can you expand on the pro-housing designation and how it plays into TCC? Do you know any communities that already have this designation? So um, the HCD's pro-housing designation program uh, was recently revamped um, and released earlier, I think it was July of this year. So they are still in the process of um, doing outreach to various jurisdictions on getting the pro-housing designation. So we are um, coordinating with HCD and other state programs to have the same um, pro-housing policy incentive structure. Um, and what, so what that means is that the, um, the communities that will have this designation um, will have get maximum uh, policy incentive points and uh, those with that have applied but don't have the designation yet or um, but have some of the policies listed, the priority policies listed, um, they will get partial points. So um, that's how we are coordinating that um, across our state programs. And then I see that there's another question on the from Sharon on the 5% for workforce development and economic opportunities. Um, 
Is that a limitation for planning or for a project? And that answer is it's for um, both plan, um, it's for a transformative plan, which um, should include a training programs and also job placement. Um, but there are some planning dollars that are eligible under that. Um, and I think Brendan has been looking into this. So if Brendan has additional feedback on that. I think that's mostly right. It's it's generally it's called the transformative plan, but will include uh, workforce direct workforce training programs for residents of the project area that result in job placement. Uh, but there are eligible costs uh, for for planning activities um, or or other sort of workforce development activities. So, for example, um, some grantees have in the past uh, decided to create a workforce uh, a local workforce uh, study plan uh, with a, a small portion of their workforce uh, transformative plan funds. Uh, to to analyze local uh, um, emerging markets and particularly greenhouse gas reducing sectors and and develop a more strategic plan to uh, serve uh, those industries and, and uh, train workers for those industries. So there are some planning funds available, but direct training um, and job placement is is the main goal of this uh, plan. Great, thanks. And then. Um, another question just came through the chat. How do we get a copy of this webinar? We will be posting this video uh, recording on our website. And a question, uh, back to the question and answer. So there's a question, what are SGC's thoughts and how are they maybe reflected in the guidelines on projects focused on non-residential areas? In other words, does SGC weigh projects focused in residential communities more than projects in downtown commercial areas. So we do not weigh projects um, more in one area or the other. What we really look for is whether or not a project is improving the lives of the residents in that area and that it is driven um, from a community led process. So um, that's how we assess the projects in the scoring criteria to look at you know, are these projects really meeting the needs? Um, and will it lead to a transformative impact in that area? And there's another question. What has been a couple of the most innovative and successful workforce development programs that you have seen in proposals? Um, one that comes to mind is that um, in our round three Stockton uh, implementation grant, we did see that the workforce development programs that were proposed were all for greenhouse gas reducing um, industries and to and were linked to the actual TCC funded proposals. And so I think that one was quite thoughtful. Um, sometimes we do get workforce development proposals that are more traditional in nature and that will not necessarily prepare residents for future jobs in a carbon constrained economy. Um, so that is one thing that we tried to clarify in this um, guidelines. And I would like to see if any of my other colleagues have any feedback on this question as well. I think you highlighted a, a good distinction that um, Sort of those most innovative and successful ones, like you said, are, are tied to uh, the projects and to, directly to greenhouse gas reducing careers. Um, but for many of those more conventional ones that may be uh, in place already in, in local neighborhoods um, and serving um, conventional industries, uh, in those cases, there's an opportunity to provide uh, upskilling for workers that may um, prepare them for future changes to that industry due to climate impacts. Um, so just an example of that is, uh, integrating electrification skills um, in, in industries that may have uh, re relied on, on um, fossil fuel uh, type vehicles or, or uh, equipment um, so that as the industry changes, they're prepared um, and understand why those changes are happening policy-wise, but also have those skills to uh, prepare them for that uh, upgraded workforce. So there's also chances to upskill conventional programs as well as uh, um, the types of connections that Sophie mentioned for uh, Stockton's.
Thanks, Brendan. Um, and we have another question that was asked anonymously. Um, any possibility of adjusting payment process so that at least small CBOs could be paid up front? It seems prohibitive for small organizations to participate when they need to float costs for months, especially if the lead applicant is a small city or other public agency that couldn't help cover costs in a shorter timeline. Same goes for providing participant stipends, food, childcare, how are these costs to be covered? So I just wanna acknowledge that this is a very good question. We know that this is something that many organizations and many of our partners have grappled with and continue to grapple with, and we did investigate it. At this time, we were not able to figure out a way to authorize uh, advanced funding based off of the structure of the program um, and sort of the way our own accounting processes work. We're open to the idea if we could figure out a way to make it work, but at, at the moment, we just couldn't, couldn't figure out how it would be authorized. Uh, we have had partners engage in some pretty innovative solutions. So, I think you, you commented on this in your comment, but many of our lead applicants who have more financial capacity have been able to come up with their own um, advanced funding structures to allow their smaller partners to uh, succeed. And they've been able to float those costs. Um, we have one partner who's partnered with a community bank in order to pro provide gap funding. Um, so we've seen people come up with their own creative solutions and we're open to that and happy to help if we can figure out a way to make it work. Um, right now, the program is going to be is expected to be restricted to reimbursement funds only. Um, and that does put a burden on people. So it may limit um, certain small organizations abilities to participate. Um, we would like to do as much as we can to mitigate that. Now, on the second question, same goes for providing participants, stipends, food, childcare. So we, we have been able to propose for these draft guidelines that these are going to be eligible costs that um, when you provide, say, a community event uh, that you can offer in-kind services or um, other provisions in order to improve participation, um, Again, though, that's not something that we can explicitly pay in advance. So they would be under the same reimbursement structure as the rest of the program. Thanks. Are there any other questions that you all would like to submit in writing or as Sarah mentioned in the chat, if you have a question you'd like to ask verbally, you can use the raise hand feature. Okay, don't see any so. Um, if you do have questions, um, please, and comments, please do um, submit them to us through our email address and um, feel free to reach out anytime as we work through this process. Let's see. Oh, it looks like we did have one question. Actually, we do have a couple questions coming in. The one comment is the current reimbursement process will continue to create barriers to disadvantaged communities that this funding is supposed to support. And we do understand this comment very deeply. Um, and we've seen this through our um, through our past grants uh, and have been able to figure out ways. So we do appreciate that. And if you have other comments on this um, or other suggestions on how we can further support communities with the reimbursement or with the funding mechanisms, please do let us know. We have done a lot of research on this and we have found that um, a lot of it comes down to legislative authority. And the next question from Anonymous is what, how should boundary changes be reflected in an implementation application? Um, 
should the boundaries be different than the planning grant boundaries? I'm not sure if these are um, linked to each other, but the, um, the boundaries do not necessarily have to be the same or different from planning grant boundaries. Okay, great. Um, so they are linked questions. So they do not have to be um, the same or different, um, but you know, just to mention that we do look at the applications, you know, justification for those boundaries and um, how much it came from, you know, community-driven process, what those projects are that are reflected in those areas and so on. So that's how that will be assessed. Great. Um, any last questions or comments from the TCC team or from anyone listening in? I'd like to just say one more time, like thank you to everyone for participating. Thank you for your questions. Um, thank you for your comments and to our anonymous commenter. You know, that comment is going to be logged. We are going to include it in the, our public review process. Um, we like to hear what you're experiencing. And if you have feedback, critical feedback on the program um, that we can try, that we can help use to make it better, we absolutely do want to hear it. So for that and for any of the other items in the program, um, please, please work with us to make it as best as we can. Great, thank you everyone.